Shalom, hello, and welcome to our online Haaretz mini-fest within the online edition of this year's Jerusalem Film Festival. In a series of interviews, we, meaning Haaretz journalists, will be talking to the directors and producers of some of the most intriguing films in the festival. Today, I have the pleasure of hosting Ryan White, the director of the movie Assassins. Hello, Ryan. I, um, it's a pleasure to meet you here. Um, I've just watched your movie, Assassins, and I, I loved it. So can we talk about the way that you got to this story? Because I know that your former movie um, yeah, that was screened last year in the uh, Jerusalem Film Festival was um, Ask Dr. Ruth. Mm -hmm. very so, different. so it's very different. Very, very I was actually uh, making both films at the same time. So um, in that way, it was a very interesting experience because both films could not be more different. And it drove Dr. Ruth crazy that I was making uh, <laughs> this film at the same time because she thought I was in danger the whole time, which I may have been. <laughs> so um, I came to this story because, well, this assassination happened February of 2017. Um, and so... If you look back at that historically for Americans, mm -hmm. that was right as Donald Trump was taking office. So here, the airwaves, the headlines were being totally dominated by everything Donald Trump. Uh, and so what was a huge political assassination that would have normally been, you know, on the news for months was just a blip on the radar in the US. So I think like most Americans, I remembered the headline and I remembered that two women had supposedly been involved in the assassination of Kim Jong-un's brother, but I didn't know much more than that. And then um, about six months later in late 2017, a journalist approached me and he had written an article that was an investigative piece into one of the female assassins. Her name is Siti Aisha. She's an Indonesian woman. And his article um, put forward the story that she was um, admitting that she had assassinated Kim Jong-nam, but she was saying she was tricked into doing it and she thought she was on a reality show when she committed the assassination. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very compelling, unbelievable story, but he said, would you be interested in making a documentary with me um, based on all the people I interviewed for my article? And a few weeks later, I was on a flight to Malaysia with him, which is where this assassination happened. And that's, that's where it all began. You said um, that uh, what you saw in the news in the US was fractions of the story. Uh, but the story is really incredible. I mean, what you see there is like a, a giant espionage story uh, about and the way that countries move people from place to place and the way they exploit those innocent people. So did you start by just having an interest in the uh, human story or was it all just the international story that uh, made you go to, to, to film it? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I was not very interested at the beginning in the whole international web part of it. Like all my films previously have been very character focused on, mm -hmm. you know, one person or maybe a group of people, but I've never made a film really about politics or, uh, you know, about international relations. And so my draw from the film from the very beginning was the question of, who are these women? Um, you know, the, the Malaysian government was saying that they were political assassins um, and the women's families and their lawyers were saying that they were innocent. Um, so that was kind of the central thrust of the whole film is like, who are these women? Where did they come from? And what led to this moment in an airport where they assassinated someone? Um, but the more we edited the film, the more we realized that the big picture could not be ignored. And by big picture, I mean the whole history of the Kim regime. You know, Kim Jong-nam, mm -hmm. the murder victim, was the oldest brother of the Kim dynasty. Many thought he should be the rightful heir to the throne and was passed up for his younger brother. Uh, he was so the also the, the beloved film, son the of Kim Jong. Sorry, he oh, was sorry? also the, the most beloved son um, of of um, King Jong Il, so 
Maybe you can tell us a bit about, about the movie, about what you knew at the beginning and what you came to know during uh, the research for the movie. Well, I was very skeptical at the beginning of making this film. The women's story seemed unbelievable. It seemed like the craziest defense ever for a murder or political assassination. So it was the longer that I made the film and the more evidence that we saw that uh, that my eyes started being open more to the fact that they might be telling the truth and that they might actually be innocent. Mm -hmm. I think The biggest part of that was getting our hands on all of the CCTV footage mm -hmm. from the airport the day the assassination happened. Like that footage wasn't public um, and most of it had never been seen before. And by the time we got our hands on it, it's thousands of hours of footage that we had to piece together. But when you start piecing that all, up to, all together, you start realizing that the footage corroborates the women's version of the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, everything... And the whole story that they had been telling all along is is confirmed by what you can watch in that footage. So the longer I made it, the more I started to realize these women might be innocent and they might be executed. And therefore, this was going to be a huge uh, miscarriage of justice. Um, you told me before that you started filming the film on the first day of the trial. So you basically didn't know what would happen at the end of the trial. And... I, I found, found it uh, so interesting in the movie, the way that you, you know, you just follow what happens at the court. Um, tell me about what, what you felt when you didn't know how your movie would end eventually. Well, I think, I think we as documentary filmmakers are pretty used to that feeling. However, this one was a little bit different in the sense that, you know, it took me 30 hours to get to Malaysia. It was two long haul flights. So it was always very difficult because we were following a trial, which is unpredictable to find out one day, you know, and a ruling would be coming in and then I would have to jump on airplanes and try to try to get there in time. But, you know, the way The way the trial unfolded was, I have to say, is one of like the more surprising moments of my entire filmmaking career. I don't, I don't want to ruin the end of the film if, if people watching this haven't seen it, but it was all looking like it was going in one direction. And mm -hmm. then the trial shifted gears at the very last second um, in a way that for us as filmmakers was, was totally shocking. And thank God we were there the, 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 the day that we covered it. But I always say like, I've made multiple films about trials and lawsuits, and I always say I'm never going to make another one because <laughs> they're so unpredictable and they can go on for years. So uh, maybe this will finally be my mm -hmm. last, but uh, <laughs> it was not a very easy way to live for the last two years, having no idea what, what was going to happen. Yeah, you said earlier that Dr. Ruth was concerned for your life. Did you ever feel like you have any threats to your life? I mean, dealing with, uh, with North Korean uh, regime is uh, considered to be dangerous. Yeah, and, you know, I was working with that journalist. His name is Doug Bok Clark, and he's, he, he works on the North Korean beat. So he's an expert on North Korea, and he was a, a great resource for me in what those dangers were. So, yeah, I mean, there were many moments where we felt... Uh, like we could be in danger or people were telling us that we should stop making this film or, you know, many, many weird things that happened um, when it comes to cybersecurity around this film. We had the FBI consulting on the film um, to, tr to try to prevent, you know, any hacking from taking place. But, you know, it was, I felt very compelled to tell these women's stories and make mm -hmm. sure the truth got out. And, My, my neck was on the line in some ways, I guess, as a documentary filmmaker, but really, you know, it was the people whose stories I was following who were really putting their necks on the line, namely the, um, the lawyers for both women mm -hmm. who seemed to be the only people in the world besides journalists at that time saying, you know, this was a North Korean plot. You know, the Malaysian government seemed um, hellbent on ignoring North Korea's involvement and on convicting these two women. And It was the lawyers, you know, getting in front of microphones and shouting from the rooftops that North Korea had orchestrated this murder. So they, they were the ones that were in the, in the true danger, much more so than myself. I also had a feeling that if you weren't there, uh, maybe if this movie would not be filmed, something different would have happened to those women. Uh, do you think so too? 
That is a very interesting question. I don't, I don't know. I can't answer that because it's hypothetical, but I, I do know that the intense amount of pressure and scrutiny that was happening mm -hmm. on the Malaysian government nearing the end of this trial uh, was, was known to them. Like they knew, they knew we were making a film. They knew that this was gonna be very public and we were starting that outreach at the end saying, you know, we were nearing the end of the trial and it was clear mm -hmm. the judge thought the women were guilty because he had, he had written a ruling that said so much. So we were starting our outreach saying, you know, we're making this film. We would love to interview you or hear why you think these women are guilty. And, you know, that is <laughs> when everything changed. So mm -hmm. it's a great question. I don't, and I always wonder this about a lot of my films because it's a big philosophical question around documentaries. If the actual making of your film can change reality. Um, if it did, in this case, it might be one of those instances where it's not a bad thing because mm -hmm. literally the, the stakes were life or death for these women. Um, and I also wanted to talk to you about politics because you said, um, I mean, we all know that uh, this murder happened uh, at the beginning of um, um, uh, Donald Trump uh, presidency. And the way he uh, dealt with North Korea, it, I mean, you, you, uh, we see it in your movie, and you, you talk about the way that they carry no responsibility for anything, uh, for any uh, of their behavior. So can we talk a bit about politics and the way that you um, kind of push your own country with this movie? Yeah, I mean, this was all new to me. I wasn't, I was no expert on, you know, international relations, especially when it comes to the North Korean regime. So uh, making this film was a real education for myself in that way. And what started happening, you know, I think, I don't know about in Israel, but I feel like there's a popular uh, way of seeing Kim Jong-un in the U.S., which is almost like a parody. Um, mm -hmm. He's almost seen as a, as a joke, like a, a maniacal madman that people laugh at. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think we take him seriously enough, as, a, as a, the American society, seriously enough as a threat. And as somebody who is not just some idiot who inherited a throne, but is somebody who has very carefully consolidated power over the last 10 years. And this assassination at the center of my film was a played a huge part in that consolidation of power. Mm -hmm. And a further stage of that was Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-un being able to put himself on the international stage. Uh, and our president, Donald Trump, legitimized Kim Jong-un in a way that previous administrations had not by being willing to meet with him on those stage despite these assassinations and despite the human rights abuses of that regime. And it, it's not just Donald Trump, you know, we have we have other scenes in the film of Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin and Moon Jae-in all meeting with uh, Kim Jong-un in the wake of this assassination as well. But I think what he's been able to achieve is, and everybody doubted this, you know, he was 25 when he inherited the throne and, mm -hmm. and nobody thought he was going to be capable of keeping, keeping this regime together. And he has certainly uh, proved us all wrong. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's pushing my country as it is as much as it is um, acknowledging what part we've played in legitimizing this totalitarian leader. And even worse than that, which is a whole part of our film, um, is, is Donald Trump being willing to throw our own government under the bus when it comes to this story where Kim Jong-nam is now known to have been um, a CIA operative mm -hmm. uh, working with the American CIA as a source. And um, Donald Trump came out publicly and said that would have never happened had he been president and therefore was uh, taking the side of Kim Jong-un and the regime and saying, your secrets are safe mm -hmm. with me. This would have never happened if I were in charge. Yeah. Um, your um, movie uh, premiered at uh, Sundance last year, right? Last January. Um, yes. I have to ask you, how did the COVID situation uh, influence your movie? Mm. Yeah, it feels like a lifetime ago mm -hmm. that it premiered at Sundance. Uh, it feels like a whole different world. So uh, I feel very lucky that we even got to go to Sundance. You know, I know, um, you know, I know many of my colleagues that were having films coming out in the later later in the year never even got an in-person festival experience. So 
Uh, it has been a very strange year, but I can't, I can't complain because we're all going through it together. Mm -hmm. um, I would have loved to have traveled with this film this year. I've been so busy the last seven or eight years that I haven't traveled much with any of my films on the festival circuit. And that was my plan this year was, you know, to come to Jerusalem, to go to all these places that we're gonna be programming this film. So um, that was sad to watch that go away, but I'm just uh, happy this film is even seeing the light of day. Cause there was a lot of time where, you know, Hollywood is very afraid of the North Korean regime mm -hmm. because of the, the hack of Sony studios that happened here. So there was a very strong chance at some point that my film was never even gonna um, come out in the US and it comes out on Friday here and it's coming out all over the world in the months after that. So, you know, it's been a tough year, but I'm just happy that the film will even be seen by anyone. Can I ask you about uh, your work now? What are you working on right now? Uh, well, I always like I always like to jump between um, between Doctor Ruth like to uh, international killings. Sorry. Exactly. Exactly. So I have a few projects right now that are much more um, fun to be working on. Um, I'm making something about design. I'm making something about uh, a musician. Um, the things that are much less heavy than assassins, but I always, I always get the itch, the investigative itch to dive back into something dark. So I'm also about to start uh, a project about a murder here in the U.S. So I'm constantly jumping between, you know, stuff that's a little lighter and stuff that's much heavier. Uh, we talked a bit about it before, but I think that if you have hadn't put your camera to that. Uh, remote uh, corner of the world, no one would notice these two women of um, uh, blue collar, I mean, very blue collar, uh, in those really remote countries. And I think you have, you have to have a certain feeling of um, wanting to take this responsibility over your shoulders. So do you feel about documentary, this feeling of uh, needing to do this and wanting to take responsibility, like a, a civil responsibility on your shoulders? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I have a, I, you know, I know a lot of filmmakers that make social issue films and feel that, feel that sort of social need to fill some sort of void that, that might not be out there and needs long term storytelling. My, my draw to filmmaking has always been um, character and less issue-based. Uh, however, that, that obviously intersects with social issues at some point. And in this film, it certainly did. I was so fascinated with how these women ended up in, these moment, in this moment where they assassinated someone. But you can't unravel that from their upbringing. And so what was so, what was so sad about this film, but also I think somewhat universal is Siti and Duan, the two women I feel like could be any 20 something woman in the entire world. You know, this story of, um, you know, people using social media to seek fame or people who've had hard upbringing seeking a better life for, uh, a bigger paycheck like Siti was, you know, she was a single mother. Mm -hmm. These are universal stories that we see, you know, not just in this corner of the world, but everywhere, including the US and Israel. And so to me, their stories were very um, universal in that way. And this, this film ultimately, I think is um, a cautionary tale about the dangers of the internet and social media. And it's also about the exploitation of young women. It's probably one of the worst case scenarios <laughs> of how badly um, a bad experience on the internet can go. But I think there are, you know, thousands, if not millions, of similar stories on a on a on a on a lesser level that are happening worldwide right now. Can you tell us about uh, those two young women? What's going on with their lives right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope that they can rebound and go back to their old lives. The, the last I saw them, though, that certainly wasn't the case. I felt uh, profoundly sad on behalf of both of them, especially Duan, who is uh, the Vietnamese woman, and she had been seeking um, a famous life for the last 10 years leading up until this moment. She was mm -hmm. on Vietnam Idol. She was an actress in prank shows. She really wanted to be a star. And... Um, unfortunately, 
um, you know, the Dewan that has gone through this experience has totally had that spirit broken. And um, I've seen her, she just wants to, uh, to be totally anonymous and not famous at all, because I think the, the ultimate irony of this story is that they were both trying to be famous and they indeed did become famous, but for all the wrong reasons. Uh, and so I think they're both trying to get back to the life that they had before this. And um, I'm hopeful that with time, they can both do that. And um, can I ask a personal question? What did you sure. feel? What did you feel when the trial was over? When um, when it became something totally different than when you what you could expect at the beginning of the trial? What did you personally feel about uh, this whole situation? I felt relief. Uh, you know, I I was. I was preparing to edit a film where these two women were convicted and executed because that's what everyone was telling us mm -hmm. was going to happen. And that was clearly the way the Malaysian government wanted it to go. And I kept thinking, how, how do you make a film proving that two women are innocent, but then the audience watches them die in the end? Like, how do I even put that out into the world and who would ever want to watch that? Um, and so that was, you know, but I couldn't stop going because I didn't know what the ending was going to be. But I kept questioning whether this was even ethically something that I could could create a film out of. Um, mm -hmm. And so the way the trial went down um, was a total surprise and a total relief in the end that I had uh, a different type of ending than what we had ever expected. Um, Ryan, is there anything that you would like to say that I didn't ask? Uh, that's important for you to say? No, I, I just, I wish I could be there in Jerusalem with you guys. I was, I was hoping to come last year with Dr. Ruth and I couldn't, and then I was supposed to come this year. So uh, I hope the audiences enjoy, enjoy the film and I'm sorry, I can't be there. Uh, Ryan, thank you so much for um, being as generous as this and, and participating in this, in this interview. Uh, thank you. And maybe thank next you. year. Maybe next year. I hope so. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.